Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Loreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. I am honored today to have one of our finest statesmen in New Mexico, former Senator Jeff Bingaman. Thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Loreen. Well, we've done shows for years because you served in the Senate for 30 years. Before that, you were New Mexico's Attorney General. Right. And when you left the Senate in... 2012? End of 2012, right. Right. You were the ninth in seniority in the whole Senate. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you for your service. Some of your honored jobs you had, you were chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee twice, from 2021 to 2002, and then from 2007 to 2012. And all the way along, although you worked on finance and health, education, labor, and pension committee, and a joint committee on the economy, I've asked you back here to talk about what you did after you left the Senate, what you went back to your alma mater of Stanford. You worked on a joint task force with George Schultz. Tell us what you were doing there. Well, I was working at the law school, at Stanford Law School, on a uh, project to, to do a sort of an inventory of what different states around the country have been doing with regard to clean energy, both to promote more use of renewable energy uh, and to promote more efficiency in the use of energy, in the production and use of energy. And uh, we came out with a report about uh, last October, uh, which, uh, which I testified to at the legislature this year here in Santa Fe. Uh, that uh, identified 12 policies that we thought were particularly effective in uh, in moving the country, moving the, those particular states uh, toward more use of renewable energy and more efficient use of energy generally. Well, so in a way you put, you distilled the, the best practices, which states are, are really moving right. forward and which states are stuck forever in the quagmire. So talk to me about a couple of those states. And that w- the, you have such a background in energy. For us to get your perspective on this, because you hear all sorts of things, and, and I really feel like I'm getting it from one of the nation's experts. So give us that, that distillation of facts. Who did really well? Well, the, the two states uh, here in the West that stand out in particular, of course, California is way out ahead of most every state in, in their commitment to, to transitioning their economy from dependence on fossil fuels to, uh, uh, to more use of renewables. Uh, uh, California first. I think uh, Colorado has done some very impressive things in, in the last few years. Uh, uh, to move in that direction as well. So those are two that I think uh, we could learn a lot from, we in New Mexico. Let's look at California for a minute, because they're calling it just like the gold rush in, in, in their ancient history. It's called the clean energy rush. They now get a quarter of their electricity from renewable sources. Mm-hmm. And they have started out like everyone did, we'll cut down our greenhouse gas emissions by 10% in 40 years. Well, they're well on their way to um, what they're going to do. 33%, getting 33% of their energy by 2020? Mm -hmm. This is phenomenal. What is it, what do they have going for them besides a favorable climate, climate, the seventh biggest economy in the world? But they were down in the pits. They were 40 billion in debt. They had that terrible... Enron thing where there there was because of tell us. Well, Governor Brown deserves a lot of credit, and the legislature there does as well. But they stepped up and and dealt with their fiscal problems uh, in a fairly straightforward way. I think they raised some taxes and they cut spending. Uh, and a combination of those two is is of course the only way to deal with with uh, fiscal problems for a state uh, and. Uh, and they have had a commitment through Democrat, Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, was very committed in, in moving the, the state toward more use of renewable energy. And, and uh, of course, uh, Governor Brown is as well. And uh, so you, you've seen a, 
a commitment to it over a long period of time, and it's uh, it's paying off. They're, they are creating jobs. They are transitioning their economy to more more use of these uh, these new technologies. And what is Colorado doing? They, are they kind of like number two in the West? Well, I think I would say so. Uh, they're uh, they're doing a lot. They they've adopted a policy that I, I wrote a article for the New Mexican. Uh, several months ago, urging that we consider it here in New Mexico. It's called a community solar uh, uh, arrangement, whereby, whereby instead of having everyone put a solar panel on his or her roof, you allow people to band together and, and to invest and be part owners of a larger facility, which can be on the edge of town or uh, in a vacant lot some someplace in, in a neighborhood. And, uh, and get credit on their utility bills for the portion of that, uh, that project that they, in fact, own. So, uh, so this is another way to promote particularly solar energy. And uh, Colorado has done that now. Uh, California is, looking, is doing it, beginning to do it. Uh, Minnesota is uh, beginning to do it. Uh, and uh, it would make a lot of sense for us in New Mexico to do it as well. Well, I'm deeply concerned that on a national level, and, and you have led the Senate, you've led the legislature for years doing the Energy Policy Act in 2005. That was the first comprehensive energy bill to become law in 13 years. And then in 2007, the most sweeping energy efi efficient national legislation put into law. And then recently, the Clean Energy Standards Act 2012 and the Renewable Portfolio. So you've been working really hard at this. So nationally, they're, the solar tax incentives are going to expire. I mean, all this work that you've done, what needs to be done nationally? Well, a lot needs to be done nationally, and I, I don't know, frankly, if the current Congress is going to do it or not, but uh, the, the wind energy industry uh, depends upon what's called the production tax credit, which mm. is a a credit that uh, that they receive as they produce energy and sell it uh, to a utility, uh, they they get a, a credit. So that's that's made it financially attractive. Uh, unfortunately, the production tax credit expired at the end of 2014, and it has not been renewed. And uh, there's real question as to whether it will be renewed in the current Congress. As you point out, uh, solar energy uh, tax credits as well. That's the investment tax credit. And that is uh, scheduled to expire at the end of 2016. And there's real doubt as to whether that will be extended or, or renewed. So uh, there's a lot that Congress should be doing in this, uh, in this uh, regard, but uh, I don't know um, how optimistic a person can be about what they're likely to do. You had, in your farewell address to the Senate, you said that we should really abandon those big sweeping energy bills and try to break them down into smaller, less controversial, less amendable and distortable units. But I don't see any even small steps. No, it's, it's difficult to do what I was recommending there because uh, everyone, at least in the Senate, uh, everyone has their own pet proposal that they want to have included in any bill that relates to energy and that starts to move through the Senate. So uh, uh, it's a difficult job for the leadership to figure out how to how to structure the the action on the Senate floor and, and get something done. But uh, but clearly we, we're in the, the problem is that energy, the subject of energy is very broad and uh, uh, you know, if, if every time someone wants to do anything related to energy, you you have the opportunity to, to have folks stand up and say, no, no, I want to do the XL pipeline. I want to do something about drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. I want to do, yeah, nuclear power. I mean, there are a lot of controversial issues that can derail uh, otherwise good legislation and, and legislation that you could get a bipartisan a majority to support. Now, um, as chair of the Energy Committee, you brought many spokespeople from all aspects of the nuclear energy issue to speak to the staffs of every senator so everyone would be up to speed. One of the things that was focused on in that was how expensive. Who, who said, isn't this a very expensive way to boil water? 
how expensive it is, the age of our nuclear facilities, and now after Fukushima, although people are preferring not to look at it, it's, it's very scary. Well, nuclear power is something I, I, I've supported uh, peaceful uses of nuclear power. I think that uh, it, it is uh, one of the best ways we can produce power uh, that is, uh, does not add to the climate change problem, mm -hmm. which is a very real problem for us. Uh, but it is very expensive. And as you say, there are safety concerns, and particularly after Fukushima, there, there are uh, very uh, real safety concerns that uh, people are worried about. Uh, and with natural gas, as cheap as it is, uh, it is so much more cheaper for a utility that wants to, wants to build additional generation capacity to do it with natural gas than to uh, consider any kind of a new nuclear plant. Uh, the cost of uh, a new nuclear plant is well in excess of $10 billion today, and, and there, there are just very few utilities that can entertain that kind of a investment. And can insure themselves. They depend on uh, government, uh, the government to insure them. Because yeah, the government does insure them. Uh, and, uh, I mean, beyond a certain point, the government insures in case there are accidents that occur. Uh, but uh, I, think that, I think the overall cost of producing power from nuclear sources is, is the biggest impediment that the industry faces. Now, it works in France. You know, they've, yeah. they have a very thriving and safe, well-regulated nuclear industry. Let's just look at what Europe is doing. If Germany, cloudy, stormy Germany, can lead Europe in solar, how can little sunshiny, bright New Mexico, how can we get up to speed with that? Well, we, we should be doing much more with solar energy in New Mexico than we are, uh, deploying it, developing it, uh, researching it. Uh, it's frankly difficult to compete not just with the Germans, but with the Chinese at this point. The Chinese, of course, have captured... Uh, the lion's share of the international market for uh, solar cells, solar panels, and uh, and uh, that that's provided a benefit to people who want to put solar panels on their roof in that the cost of those panels has come down substantially, but it makes it very difficult for a manufacturer in New Mexico or anywhere in the country that wants to compete uh, to try to figure out how to do that. So what can New Mexico do to get up to speed in the competitive clean energy market? Well, we can, we can obviously, we can look at the uh, policies and the incentives that other states, Colorado, California, other states around the country have put in place and try to adopt some of those. And we can put it on our state's agenda. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's very little uh, focus or a priority given to the whole issue of uh, clean energy at this point. In, in New Mexico, everyone's happy with the fact that we're producing more oil and gas than we ever did, but uh, uh, that's no reason why we shouldn't also be pursuing this, uh, this set of new technologies that uh, I think we're going to see the world more and more reliant on in the future. So from your, uh, we're speaking today with Senator Jeff Bingaman, uh, who has been uh, really one of our experts on energy, who studied it in depth. So let me just ask you about two other thorny issues in the clean versus dirty energy debate, which is fracking and the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. Well, I'm somewhat uh, out of step with many of my uh, uh, allies in, in some of these issues. On fracking, I think it is something that the industry has done for a very long period of time. Uh, if proper procedures are used in, uh, in the drilling operations, I think fracking uh, is something that makes some sense. The, the seismic problems, the earthquakes that have occurred as a result of oil and gas activity, particularly in Oklahoma, but in other par parts of the country as well, are not a result directly of fracking, uh, they're a result of the reinsertion of, of water into mm -hmm. these reservoirs. Um, and I think obviously that needs to be controlled as well. But uh, I, I, I'm not one that favors a, any kind of blanket uh, ban on fracking. Uh, so so the, on the XL pipeline, 
my own view is we've got pipelines all around New Mexico, and uh, uh, it is hard for me to see, based on what the State Department concluded in their in their report a year or so ago, it's hard for me to see how the emissions from uh, from the uh, tar sands that that they're going to be using. Uh, to produce the the oil that goes into this uh, Keystone pipeline, how those emissions are not going to be produced if we just by stopping the pipeline. Mm. The, the truth is, they're going to find another way to get that to market. So um, I don't see a great advantage to the country or to the world or to the environment from uh, stopping that uh, pipeline myself. So since we're talking about thorny issues, what is called climate change, you know. Um, there are several states and nations that are really actively um, making decisions like California to reduce their greenhouse gases. Um, what can we what, what can we do in New Mexico? S taking the dis debate about it, there is scientific proof that the, the climate is changing. But every time we have a flood or every time we have a monster snowstorm, people are saying, oh, it's not global warming. But everyone knows that the weather isn't quite the way it used to be. So how can we, without getting political, how can we be smart and, and work toward heading off some of the deleterious effects of climate change? Well, I think you know, the president has identified the, the key areas in which we need to make progress. He's identified transportation and said we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all the vehicles we're driving and, and uh, and the, the one thing he's been able to do uh, since we finally changed the law in 2007 to allow the administration to improve uh, CAFE standards, corporate uh, average fuel economy standards yeah. for, for cars and trucks, and, and he's ramped those up very substantially, so he deserves credit on that. He also is trying to get the EPA to adopt a final standard on, on emissions from uh, from uh, coal-fired power plants, essentially, to try to try to reduce emissions there. Uh, I hope that that can be successful. Uh, we need to, frankly, in, instead of just waiting for Washington to uh, mandate these things, we need to have, have our own strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in this state. And, uh, and I, I really don't see that at the current time. It, uh, I mean, Clearly, P and M is having to do some things in order to accommodate the demands of the Environmental Protection Agency, and and those are those are to the good. The question is, are they good enough? And uh, there's a big debate going on about that. I think what what I hear you, and when you say, "Why can't we be doing all of this?" We are so lucky in New Mexico to have the amount of natural resources, especially in terms of oil and gas. It's what provides, it's where the rubber hits the road. It helps our budget so much. But I don't see any reason why we can't be working with renewables and still grateful for uh, the old technology that is giving us such a nice income. Yeah. Um, it's not either or anymore. No, we're going to be dependent on fossil fuels uh, for some substantial period here going forward. But uh, we need to be part of finding an alternative to those fossil fuels and that's that's where I think we are doing less than we we could do in New Mexico. And it would be such economic development because those solar and wind energy jobs and manufacturing manufacturing are huge. Yeah. No, it's 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 a significant part of the economy as you pointed out earlier in in California and uh and in several states it's a much more significant part of the economy than than we've been able to make it here. Well, I'm going to ask you to take off your energy wizard hat and put on your health care hat because you did a lot of work with health care. Um, how do you think things are I mean, we're just muddling forward. Um, but it was a, really a, a great blessing that uh, the governor, Governor Martinez, chose to accept the Medicaid um, expansion in the state because we had 400,000 people without health insurance. So that was a very yeah. visionary thing to do. But what else do you see happening as the insurance companies try to um, – it didn't quite turn out the way anybody thought. Right. And they're now making a lot of adjustments, which may be expensive for the customer. Well, they may be. I think that uh, we'll, we'll see once the, once the rates uh, actually uh, 
are reviewed and, and agreed upon. But uh, <clears throat> no, I, I agree with you. The, the governor did the right thing by agreeing to the expansion of Medicaid. And that's been a very good thing for New Mexico. We've got, uh, I don't know exactly how many, but close to a couple hundred thousand New Mexicans with insurance coverage now that didn't have it before. Most of those under Medicaid. Some of them uh, uh, getting subsidies under the Affordable Care Act uh, because of their, their income level. Uh, even though they're not eligible for Medicaid, they are eligible uh, for those subsidies, and that's been a big benefit too. I think the, the figure there that I've heard is, is closer to 50,000 additional New Mexican have, have signed up for that since the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act was signed. So uh, I think overall it's, it's, uh, it's accomplishing what uh, I had hoped it would in New Mexico. It's expanding coverage. I think it's also had the effect nationwide of keeping the, co the growth in the cost of health care down and, and uh, uh, we'll have to see what happens this next year with rates, uh, insurance rates uh, for health care. But I, I'm confident that they're going to be less because of the Affordable Care Act than they would have been otherwise. Uh, so that, I think, is positive. Um, we've saved some huge thorny issues for the last five minutes, but um, Citizens United and the definition, the Supreme Court's definition of money as being speech has really affected our elections here and nationally. I frankly dread the next campaign. Yeah. Um, do you think it can be amended? Do you think this Senate, this legislature can just go back to speech being speech? No, they can't because the Supreme Court has said uh, the Constitution uh, protects the right of billionaires to spend unlimited amounts on these uh, campaigns, which is a very unfortunate conclusion. Uh, but until we have a different makeup on the Supreme Court, uh, I don't think we can see that reversed. And of course, since the Supreme Court says it's in the Constitution, the legislature, the, the U.S. Senate and House cannot change it. Now, they could adopt a uh, uh, much more effective uh, requirements with regard to transparency. Uh, part of the problem here is that uh, not only are unlimited amounts uh, flowing into these campaigns now, but uh, it's impossible for anyone to really keep up with where that money's coming from or who's, who's uh, buying these attack ads that, uh, uh, that you see on television or, or on the Internet or wherever it is you see them. Uh, as a, you know, as just a citizen, it, it, it wounds me to see so many hateful negative things about nobody's going to ever want to run for office again because they make you out to be a monster. And, and it's, it, it, it's very sad for me to see. Now, another sad thing in the last couple of minutes, the economy. New Mexico has failed, and we get a little bright light here and there, but... The, our surrounding states have bounced back from the 2008 recession, and we haven't. What can we do? Well, I don't think there's a silver bullet to solve that problem, but you're right. I think our, uh, our economic uh, recovery from the recession has been slower um, and uh, uh, has, has, not, has not come about the way it has in many of our surrounding states. Uh, I think we need, obviously, we need a comprehensive approach to solving that problem. We need more effort to bring tourists here. We need more effort to support manufacturing here. We need more effort to support small businesses in the state. Uh, there was a very a modest uh, piece of legislation that I know the governor signed here in the last few days to try to keep in place uh, and add uh, very minimal amounts to, to existing tax credits. Uh, uh, that's that's positive. It's to the good, but it's not near adequate uh, to do what needs to be done. So we're just going to keep on moving in place, but at least we're still moving. Um, you are doing some exciting things, speaking of still moving. You're doing a seminar at UNM in the Honors College talking about major issues. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. Well, I am going to do that this fall and uh, hope, to, hope to find some things that are of interest to, to students down there. And you're doing a lot of work on boards, our beloved Santa Fe Institute. I'm on the board of, uh, the board of trustees at the Santa uh -huh. Fe Institute. Right. And the National Academy of Science? 
I'm on a, one of their boards and then I'm on another of their studies that we're doing uh, on middle skills and how to ensure that, that uh, the country is producing people with the skill sets that they need in order to, to keep a modern economy operating. So that's... Uh, I had not heard that, that term before, middle skills. Well, it seems to be a popular term. It's, it's one that uh, uh, it, it, it's not... The idea being that uh, you don't have to have a PhD in order to have these skills, but uh, they are essential whether they're in healthcare or whether they're in uh, high-tech manufacturing or, or what, whatever uh, sector of the economy they're in. You're also working on with a bipartisan policy center in D.C. about retirement security. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to figure out what could be done. Uh, by the uh, current or future Congresses to, to make better provision for retirement security. There are a lot of uh, Americans still who, who get to retirement age and, and uh, they have Social Security benefits perhaps, but nothing, nothing beyond that. And uh, there are hopefully some policies that we could adopt in Washington that would help that situation. Well, I'm, you know, as I talk to you and look at you. I, you really are a true statesman. And when I look at the, the breadth of your endeavors, and, and I want to thank you for all the hard work you've done, but I must ask you this. After all your hard work, are you an optimist or a pessimist at this point? Well, I'm optimistic uh, in general that uh, the country will continue to do well and will continue to improve. I think I'm always frustrated, as I'm sure you are, that uh, Progress is so slow, and sometimes you do take two steps back uh, for each step forward for a while. Um, and uh, uh, I think we're in a period uh, where it's difficult to get consensus in Washington about what we ought to do. And uh, that's, that's causing uh, the American people substantial frustration, and uh, I share that frustration. Yes, and so do I. But as you make your steps forward, I hope they'll come back here and well, tell us you. more of your, your research. We will work on updating our, um, our, green energy, our clean energy endeavors here, all of us, something all of us can do personally. But I want to thank you, the great statesman, our former senator, Jeff Bingaman. Thank you for joining us. Great, great to be with you as always. Thanks. As always. And I'm Lorreen Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll be back next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.